Uh, my name is Michael Ray Matthews, and I'm honored to be the Senior Fellow for Religious Affairs with People for the American Way. And I want to welcome you to this Instagram Live series, The Race Set Before Us. I am here this day, this afternoon and evening, with uh, two colleagues and another coming uh, who are leading important work for People's Wars Defend the Black Vote campaign. Uh, my dear sister, Dewana Thompson and Emil Washington of the Black Equity and Strategy Trust are with us today. And Savante Myrick, who's the president and CEO of People4, will be with us very shortly. Welcome to you, Dewana and Emil. Thank you, Brother Michael Ray. It's great to be here with you tonight. Indeed. Thank you for having us both. Oh, it's good to see you. Good to see you both. Um, I want us to begin this conversation by thinking a little bit about the people who are in the great cloud of witnesses, as we like to say, um, in church spaces uh, coming out of the scriptures. Who are the ancestors that we see watching us have this vital and important conversation today? Is there an ancestor that you would name that you would want to bring into this space as we get started this evening? I'll defer to you, D. You know, one thing I love about having conversations with Michael Ray Matthews is that he is always going to um, evoke, invoke the presence of uh, our ancestors and just remind us that we um, come from such a um, rich history and legacy. And so I'm grateful for uh, this question. And I was thinking, about it and i'm like oh gosh it's, it could be so many people um <laughs> being a, a lifelong resident and um, from birmingham i think i would be remiss if i didn't bring reverend fred shuttlesworth um mm -hmm. into this conversation uh who was a man committed and dedicated to what faith um looked like uh in action and what faith looked like um, standing up for the ideals that and the values that we believe in and who at a time where it was most unpopular was absolutely committed to utilizing faith as a way to advance the vote, to yes. advance um, civil rights and um, to advance um, to advance people of color, particularly mm -hmm. black people in the South in a critical way. And so I think that he would be leaning, uh, if you knew him, which I did have a pleasure of meeting him before he passed, you would know that he was not a man who sat down, he paced, mm -hmm. <laughs> he would be leaning in uh, the way I hope that we do tonight. Yes. Um, he would be challenging us and he would be bringing, you know, a reverent, uh, uh, a reverence of, uh, our God and our work into the space, and so I bring uh, and I and I and I bring Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth name into the space for for this moment. I say, I say. How about you, brother Emil? Um, I I thought long and hard about this, and um, there was one person that just kept uh, coming up, and it was uh, my maternal grandmother um, mm -hmm. that uh, I lost in twenty twenty one. Her last uh, opportunity to vote was in what you know we thought was the most critical election of our time, being 2020. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually got an opportunity to do, um, which I challenge and encourage everyone to record her and just have a conversation with her on tape. She was the last surviving of uh, which we always get mixed up is either 15 or 17 um, siblings that her her parents had, wow. um, you know born in, in 1932 um, and to her father who uh, was a former slave that was able to buy land. Uh, because of him, we have over a hundred acres of land in wow. Louisiana um, wow. that we still own uh, to this day. And so I think about um, what they endured, what she sacrificed um, and then her, you know, fighting through um, her cancer in her last days, but still being able to exercise her her right understanding the importance and the and the value of it, and um, you know it's it's interesting in the work that Dewan and I do um, in a collective space. We we're very intentional about not trying to tell people, um, especially younger generations, that someone died for their their right to vote. 
Um, but there are people that literally did die for their right to vote. And there are people who they're dying, which was to be able to cast their, their vote. So I do want to, to honor that and um, all that she was able to, to pour into us um, on this day. Indeed, indeed. Say her name for us. Her name is Pearly May Brumfield. Mm. Ashe, Ashe. Ashe. Welcome, Brother Savante. Uh, you want to you wanna jump in here and tell us a bit about the ancestor on your mind coming into this space? Uh, thank you so much for letting me be here. Um, as you know, Michael Ray, uh, I am a recovering politician. So I am, of course, going to cheat on this question and mention two people. All right. Um, my most immediately deceased ancestor, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, mm. Phyllis, Phyllis Rabel, who um, was herself a recovering Republican, mm. Rockefeller Republican, wow. you know? so the 95 years old, and she watched that party turn from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last election she voted in, she, she, she never stopped being outraged. From the very first time as a librarian in the public school that I grew up in, she went in defiance of the principal's orders, she and the five other women who worked there, in pants, not dresses, mm -hmm. but they wore pants in school. And they were all sent home that day mm -hmm. uh, in violation of the dress code. She never um, stopped being disgusted at injustice. But the other ancestor I have is, is more of a, a spiritual one than a uh, literal one, and that's Norman Lear, the founder of People for the American mm -hmm. Way, and whose offices I'm sitting in now, uh, who passed away at 101 years old this past December. So this is the first election uh, since 1924. Uh, forgive me, no. This is the first election since 1920 mm -hmm. without Norman Lear on, on this planet. He grew up in Brooklyn, fought in World War II, changed the face of American culture, founded our organization. And two weeks before he died at 101 years old, he asked me what more he could do in the upcoming elections. Mm -hmm. He just cared about it so mm -hmm. much. Uh, he wanted us to achieve justice so badly. And so I'm thinking of him. Lovely. Say both of their names for us. Phyllis Ravel and Norman Lear. Ashe. 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 And I will briefly add one more ancestor to the cloud of witnesses in this space. Uh, his name is Green Harkness. He is my mother's father's father's father. And I found him in the midst of the pandemic doing some, some research on the family. And I found where he was the first in our line, at least on that line, to register to vote on June 28th, 1867. And so I bring into this space and honor my second great grandfather, Green Harkness, Ashe. So it is National Voters <laughs> Registration Day. Uh, today, People for the American Way launched a sermon toolkit online. We'll put the uh, link for that um, in the chat. Um, this toolkit is meant to support clergy and faith leaders uh, leading efforts in their congregations during this election season. Uh, we're calling it the race that is set before us, and it's based on a very familiar scripture uh, from the letter to the Hebrews in that 12th chapter where the writer talks about the great cloud of witnesses who are gathered around us. And so we're trying to place the significance of this election within the context of a much longer arc of a transgenerational race that's rooted in the stories and the wisdom of our elders, of our ancestors. And that is also focused, not just behind us, but before us, a long future of descendants who might be saying our names in subspace like this. Folks will never meet. This is meant to support the Defend the Black Vote campaign, which is uh, a framework for People for American Ways, um, African-American Religious Affairs Program. I'm wondering, Mill, if you could just underscore just a little bit about Defend the Black Vote and why it is essential for People for's strategy this season. I mean, the title speaks for itself, um, if we're being very honest, right? In the in the literal sense, um, the, the Black vote um, has been under attack for, for so long that I don't know if we remember when it wasn't under attack, right? Um, and so the what P4 has done is been very intentional. Um, the conversations that have been had did not start last week, right? Mm -hmm. they, they started, honestly, last year on how to frame um, 
the work that we're doing. Um, and at, at one point, honestly, it was doing a framework of targeting black men, um, understanding that that is a, a key group um, to really drive getting the vote out. But I, I, the other thing was realizing that GOTV and get out the vote can't start in October, mm -hmm. right? It has to start early. And mm -hmm. the way that that is, is by figuring out who are your actual partners on the ground, because no one organization can do anything by themselves, mm -hmm. and then be able to empower and uplift those spaces and fund them properly, right? And so that's what the Defend the Black Vote under PFAW has been doing is tapping into a lot of those who have already been doing this work since um, the inception of the, the programming with the religious affairs to, to this day and infusing and bringing in. So going from the churches to the barbershop and in certain spaces on the block, um, not necessarily in the clubs, but around the clubs, <laughs> maybe some of the food trucks, but you have to meet people where they are, right? Yes. You can't defend something if you don't know how to talk to them. You can't defend something if you don't know what you're defending and who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's really the crux of, of a lot of this work in doing it and meeting people directly where they are, but using the tools and resources that are available, understanding that you know, yard signs are great, but they don't vote, right? So you have to get on the phones, you have to text, you have to mm -hmm. um, knock on doors, you have to host events, you have to be where the people are, you have to get your hands dirty. And that is the, the whole premise. Right now in some of our states, you're seeing purges happening. Mm -hmm. North Carolina, mm -hmm. a massive purge of over 200,000 people. Georgia is rampant with the ability for any one of us on this call to be at night like our labor, we can go and challenge their right to vote. And there's nothing that's stopping that. There's no real system in place to be able to protect people from just hatred. And so that's what a lot of this is, being able to provide tools and resources so people know how to protect themselves. And also learning that voting is just a tool in our tool belt. It's, it's one part we have to do the follow-up before and after. That's right. That's right. Lots of organizing and advocacy and lobbying and engaging everyday people, indeed. Dewana, you have been stewarding the Black vote uh, for probably all of your professional career. You are so well known because you've done so much to amplify the Black vote um, and steward it in such a powerful way. So appreciate your leadership uh, across Thank the years. You. Can you talk to us about what the Black vote means at this moment? What is it that we can celebrate about the Black vote and what must we be concerned about regarding the Black vote in this moment and going forward? You know, thank you for, for sharing that. And um, I vacillate right now between Fannie Lou saying she was sick and tired of being sick and tired mm -hmm. um, with the idea that in the last election cycle, actually the last two election cycles, mm -hmm. the fastest growing demographic of voters have been between the ages of 18 and 30. Mm -hmm. So why do I bring those things up when I talk about the Black vote? Mm -hmm. I think that it's critical for us to understand that um, the Black vote is layered. It is not that every single person uh, who considers themselves to be a Black voter is going to vote or have the same values, mm -hmm. who are going to who um, look at or are experiencing the same conditions. Um, and what I think has happened and why the Black vote is so critical in this moment is because there is uh, an awakening that has happened, particularly over probably, I would say, the last five or six weeks. <laughs> um, as we know, we are, you know, uh, nonpartisan in this work that we're doing. However, um, I think that we have to be critical about noticing when there's a shift in energy, yes. noticing when there's a shift in message, a shift in um, the way in which people are being empowered. Um, and I, I truly believe that because the Black vote is so critical and it has been um, purposefully seen that when the Black vote is leveraged a certain kind of way, it can shift and hold, um, a, a shift a whole election, right? Mm -hmm. It can make or break a candidate. It can make or break an issue. And so there's why we also see the attack. Um, on the black vote. We, that is absolutely why we have seen a Southern strategy. It's the reason why we've seen um, 
uh, people wake up and go to a voting booth that they've been or to a polling site that they've been going to for 20 years. And then all of a sudden it's not there right. or they're no longer, you know, they're not open that day, which yes. we see every like election cycle. It's yes. crazy. Um, and so I think that when you talk about defending the black vote, a, a key part of that is, first of all, understanding where we are um, and what we need every, you know, if you're talking about voters in North Carolina, it's a very different conversation than voters in Florida. Mm -hmm. than voters in Georgia, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and so the messages uh, cannot be uh, static and those messages cannot just be like, hey, because somebody, I think Emil said this earlier, hey, somebody died, so you should be able to, you should muster up the energy to go vote. The mm -hmm. problem is, is that people are still dying. Right. 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 And it's not necessarily that um, they're dying in advance of the right to vote. Um, but we are still losing Black lives in um, the most uh, inhumane ways. And people mm -hmm. are having a hard time understanding how to align their vote as a strategy right, right. Um, with that. And so the Black vote is very critical because um, what is in front of us in, in this election cycle, uh, two very interesting um, ideas of what America can be and what it should be. Um, and I am very concerned. Would you say concepts of yeah. concepts of a plan of a thought of what America could do? You, say, <laughs> the con idea. you know what, Savante? I'm not going to do this with yes. you tonight. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I'm that there's some, <laughs> there's, some, there's some very different uh, posturing around <laughs> what could be. Um, but what I believe is that there are individuals who literally will not survive yeah. Um, yeah. in in the context of one frame um, and there are individuals who want to live to fight another day in the context mm -hmm. of another and so that's why the black vote is critical it is giving us the opportunity to um, position ourselves to fight another day position ourselves um, and that's really what this race set before us means, right? It is, um, I remember when I was reading the message version of this scripture mm -hmm. and it said, never quit. Mm. Yes. In the message, right? Never quit. Never Meaning quit. that, well, if you're saying never quit, that means you're, it means that you are having to continue. It's yes. not a one stop and done. And so. Yes. That is, that's what I think about right now. When I think about the Black vote in, in, in the moment that we're in, it is a marathon. Um, and, and, and we are we, we have to continue to push forward. Mm -hmm. A marathon, a transgenerational marathon, like mm -hmm. the, the baton is being passed <laughs> constantly. Yes. And yes. we have to be thinking strategically, being centered in our values. I love that notion of aligning um, a strategy and values with with our vote. I feel like the conversation about why the ancestors matter with younger voters would be richer if we were framing it the way you just did, as opposed to um, a call to feel somehow guilty or okay. ashamed, but to okay. create the space. Let's have that hard conversation. Let's see if we can get past, you know, concepts of a plan. Well, there's, come a, up with a, there's plan. a difference between shaming someone and honoring yeah. another. Yes. And indeed. we don't honor enough more than we do to, to shame. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Savante, you want to tell us about why this matters for people for the American way, the importance of the religious affairs program to people for and, and what it means to revive the work of this program in this season? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, first of all, just stunned, Emil, to want to thank you uh, so much. Um, hard acts to follow. I mean, yeah, it, it, what you have to do is consider the alternative, right? Mm -hmm. What's the alternative to choosing our leaders? What is yeah. it? What, what do we do if we don't have a say in who governs us? In the streets that we walk on, that we drive on, the buildings we live in, the businesses we own, what's the alternative? We've tried that before. Mm -hmm. Like That's for right. a lot of human history, we've tried that before. Right. And it is not pretty. It sucks. So um, voting, it's imperfect. It's imperfect. So imperfect. 
For sure. Um, you know, and I, I'm finding that now. You, is, you, you know, I was, the first person I voted for was myself. <laughs> I voted for the city council when I was 20. The second person I voted for was Barack Obama. I was like, this voting thing is fucking great. Mm -hmm. Pardon my language. Sorry, Reverend. Pardon my language. <laughs> this voting thing is great. Yeah. It's you, you show up, you vote, you win yeah. progress. Yes. And of course, uh, you know, maturity is is um, not cursing on the live stream. I can't believe I did that. I'm so sorry, <laughs> guys. You're good. Uh, so sorry. Uh, but maturity is realizing that it's not always perfect. You don't, uh, it's not always excellent and exciting, mm -hmm. but it beats the heck out of the alternative. Yeah. And that's what we feel here. You know, People for the American Way, we were founded 44 years ago by Norman Lear and Barbara Jordan, right? a white Jewish man from Brooklyn and a black woman, the first black woman elected to Congress in the post Reconstruction mm -hmm. South. Right? She was in those Nixon Watergate hearings that's right. talking about the need to hold a renegade executive accountable. The fact that even the president of the United States needed to follow the mm -hmm. law, right? The, 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 the rule of law mattered. Yeah. These two people together created this organization because they felt that despite all other differences, differences in housing or gun policy or, or um, pollution or whatever else, there were three things that we should be able to agree on America as, as Americans. It's truth, justice, and the American mm -hmm. life. Truth, we should be able to speak that truth. If it's uncomfortable, we should be able to teach that truth in schools. Mm -hmm. Justice means that our, our our courts should be uncorruptible. Supreme Court justices of all people should not be accepting bribes. Mm -hmm. And that we should be able to trust that our courts are going to be fair. And then the American way is the vote. In fact, that everybody should have the right to vote. And everybody's vote should count just the same. Those three principles, that's what we fight for, at people for the American mm -hmm. way. And the truth is, what's beautiful about our organization, what I love about us after having run for office four times myself, is that we don't stop running. We don't get no ways tired. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seventh, we are still here. Yeah. In the spring, we are still here. We still partner with our faith leaders, uh, no matter what's happening in their communities. Uh, we never go home. Yeah. And uh, that's really important for us. But we don't want to also, I don't want to mislead you, the most important times still do come every four years. Indeed. Every four years is when people's voice matters the yeah. most. So when you can register not only your your um, voice, but actually wield your power. So that's why we partner with our faith leaders. They've always been at the heart for 40 plus years. Our black faith leaders have been at the heart of what we do here at People for the American Way. And I hope that continues, uh, even if uh, some of them resigned because they heard me you can't have me after six o'clock, Michael Wright. I'm so sorry. If you could hear I mean, some of us preachers. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Well, listen, uh, I thank you for, for bringing up uh, Barbara Jordan and we say her yeah. name and say Ashe um, and bringing up the history of why this, this relationship between mm -hmm. The religious affairs uh, program and the larger vision of people for the American way is, is so important. This toolkit is meant to steward that commitment. It reflects a conviction that this work is generational. We've been talking about, you know, the importance of relating across generations in this conversation today. I've been using the language of transgenerational to talk about that because it's not just about those of us who are living right now in a multi-generational conversation, but what does it mean to understand this is a conversation that we're having with people who were here before us and aren't here anymore. And it's also a conversation we're setting up for people who aren't here yet. So it's connected to the activism and the creativity uh, that's hundreds of years old. And it's also yeah. connected to activism and creativity that will take place hundreds of years from now. And what we have to do right now, I think, is to see this work as also co-generational. I've been learning yeah. that term from the organization co-generate. Mm -hmm. This is more than multi-generational. This is about mm -hmm. the notion that there's a mutuality in this dynamic between generations who are alive on the earth right now that there's a mutual learning and wisdom between and among generations mm -hmm. in this struggle, and that we as elders and young people and everybody in between have something to offer one another in this movement moment. And I, I wonder if we might close with your reactions to that proposition, that this is a co-generational moment for us to figure out how to have conversations across generations about voting and about our history and about our future. 
Anybody want to jump in on that? I, uh, uh, um, as always, I, I'd like to start speaking before I think. Is that a, is that allowed? Go for it. We'll we'll clean it up. <laughs> we'll clean it up. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for for correcting that. I'm so important. Norman, I met at ninety, our, the founder of our organization. He tried to keep a friend in every decade of life. Mm. Uh, he thought that it connected him to the whole human experience. And uh, the word he used, uh, which sort of blew me away, is he, he said he tried to show respect to the younger generation. You know, we ask young people to show respect to their elders um, and then patience to the younger folks. He flipped it. He flipped it. He often said, be patient with me because I want to respect what you as younger people are bringing. And I think that is such a fascinating way to approach the moment we're in, to say, um, that yes, young people who, who have been cowering under their desks mm -hmm. since kindergarten mm -hmm. may have some wisdom in this election cycle mm -hmm. that folks who are 16 and above don't have, yeah. who never had to do that yes. before. That young people whose children, not grandchildren, not great-grandchildren, whose children will be alive in the year 2124, mm -hmm. may have something to say that's interesting about our climate. Yeah. And where it's headed, yeah. um, and then the patience. You know, I I, as I was a young person on the scene when I got into politics, and I bust in just saying, if you haven't fixed it by now, you must not be capable. Everybody out of my way, <laughs> and I was so wrong. I was so wrong. I think if we could ask the younger generations to take a scan and see who's on your side, see who's been fighting with you, see who you could link arms with, mm -hmm. I think this co-generational work would go much further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I go back to the message version of the scripture you gave, and there's a part in there that says, when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, and that long litany of hostility that he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. Um, <laughs> so when I think about why it is incredibly important to have a co-generational co um, approach, to have a intergenerational approach, um, there is something to be said about the wisdom of knowing and have seen, right? Yes. yes. Um, and there is something to be said about those who have no fear because they have not yet experienced. Mm -hmm. And so I think that by telling our stories, it's the reason why we have to push for our history to be told uh, and to be maintained in schools. It's the reason why we have to push for um, a collective story of America that doesn't exclude the experience of anyone who, who's here and who's been here, who's brought here, mm -hmm. um, who's, who's persevered here. Um, but also I think it's something, one of my mentors that I had the privilege to be mentored by Harry Belafonte, um, who in his own uh, giant and brilliant way uh, mm -hmm. at 78 uh, was reminded that work still needed to happen when he saw a nine-year-old handcuffed in a classroom and arrested and it enraged him. Mm -hmm. And that is actually how he started his organization, one of the last organizations that he ever started, which was the Gathering for Social Justice, which I had an opportunity to be a part of. But in that he said to us the very first day, he said, we got you your rights. We got you opportunities, but we forgot to teach you the strategies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that it's mm -hmm. the strategy mm -hmm. that we need and voting is a strategy, mm -hmm. right? We mm -hmm. talk about um, defending the black vote. We talk about the race set before us. It's strategic. It's needing to understand, you know, how all of this shows up in many different ways, how the literacy tests that are still on the ballot in North Carolina this year. Come on now. How it just got off of the ballot in Alabama in the last election cycle. I mean, this stuff is in front of us and we cannot, every perspective is critical for us to run the race. Yeah. And so 
I'm glad that we are committed to that. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be aligned with an organization that um, is committed to thinking about this in, the, in that way. Um, when we talk about truth justice, truth justice in the American way, um, I think that's powerful if we really stand in the in the in the stand in that, which I believe that this leadership is doing with Solante. We give you grace, brother, because you know it is what it is sometimes, you know. Yes, yes. Um, and so um, you know, I think that's what I what I think about when we talk about uh, the need for this to be a true generational effort. Um, yeah. and why those voices are each needed in the space. Indeed. And by the way. A co-generational conversation is probably going to have a few, you know, word I bombs. Think it's just going to have a few <laughs> word bombs in it. I'm just saying. So just get ready. I'm saying it's so out of character. Usually people are cussing at me. I just right. want to say that. Listen, it's, 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 it's a lot going on, Fred. It's a lot going on. It's, it's, and it, and it's okay. Um, All right. So Rue's daddy. Rue's daddy's last. So Right. Uh, I, I struggle with this. Um, and I struggle with it coming from... Um, deeply rooted in the black church. Um, I just, we just finished our um, general conference for the AME church. Um, and so let me say this, co-generational and intergenerational models is the only way to succeed, period, full stop. But in order for that to happen, those from both sides need to be willing to listen um, and talk when appropriate. Um, and not from a st standpoint of like, the respect your elders, but being understanding and knowing when is the proper time to say things and step up and step back. Um, the challenge I face is um, some generations uh, come from a space of entitlement and some generations come from a space of um, I've been here this long, so um, I'm going to stay here. And those people need to get out of the way from each side right in order for the real progress to to take place um and until we're able to properly um do that i think we're going to struggle right um and so it's empowering people who are ready to fight in a good way right the good fight um and reminding them that they're not fighting alone um and then those from the the seniors and those who have the wisdom being more empowered to actually um, pour in, right? And I, I think that some of them sometimes are silenced by their peers um, for the sake of status quo. Um, and and I, I really believe that in order for this to, to take place, it has to be um, an opportunity where someone of this current generation that Dewan and I sometimes don't necessarily connect to, right? Being <laughs> in our forties with someone in the 20, um, and then being able to uh, connect with someone in their sixties and eighties, right? Like th if you don't have all of that working together, you're gonna get a lot of lost in translation and you're gonna get a lot of frustration and it, it hinders the, the progress. And that's when you get, you know, some of the F-bombs out of frustration, not out of emphasis, right? Because sometimes you need a good F-bomb, right? Um, as uh, our dear VP almost gave last week. Um, so I think that <laughs> there's context for it all, but in order to move forward any type of movement, right? It has to be co-generational. The civil rights movement there's no way it doesn't, it succeeds without the children's crusade, mm -hmm. period. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. And the children's crusade is successful because of SNCC and SCLC and them being able to do the things that they did. It all yes. worked in tandem. It's yes. not one particular thing and you're going to be successful. Um, you have to figure out the role that you play and own that and be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to offer just one, one reflection on this as well. And I think there might be one question we'll try to squeeze in before we close. Um, the word curiosity has come to my mind a lot as I thought mm. about this. And mm. there are many times when we're ready to defend our viewpoint or defend our status or position when perhaps we need to just practice curiosity to try to understand that. why, why is this person coming to this way of looking at the world in the way mm -hmm. that they do? What is it about 
your story that I need to understand, you know, Mother Jones? What is it about how you grew up in this community, young Gen Z, that will help me understand why you have the questions and the convictions that drive how you show up in the world. I think that yeah. practice of some curiosity on the part of all of us, wherever we are yeah. in the on the continuum is, is vital. It's vital. And sometimes that will mean breaking our own rules um, about how we want people to talk to us. And, but it you shouldn't. Because you know. it all it is is being human and seeing someone for who they are as a person. Right. Yes. And I think what you're speaking of, or at least what I heard was empathy. Right. Yeah. And yes. and Empathy's reminding right. people Love there's it. a yes. difference between empathy and sympathy and putting yourself and removing yourself, removing some of those blocks and blinders. And it will allow conversations to go much further. It will allow progress to happen much faster. Yeah. Um, so I, I love the, the notion of curiosity versus immediately defending. Yes. Um, probe just a little bit. It's OK to ask a question. Yes, indeed. And marry that curiosity with empathy. I love the mm -hmm. way you edit that too. Yeah. Okay, here's the question we, we have. In trying to engage 18 to 24 year olds, potentially unregistered to vote or just generally skeptical about voting and engaging in the process period, how can we equip credible messengers and recruiters? How can we equip credible messengers and recruiters? Thoughts on that? Uh, there's lots of thoughts. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the first is to not what we just talked about, right? Like the curiosity and um, you have to, I think, to some extent, humble yourself to not assume that you know everything. Um, we go into some some of those conversations um, as if we know all because our lives have been lived longer than than those. Um, and it immediately shuts people down, right? Like. You, if you're coming in and telling somebody why they should or shouldn't do something versus trying to understand what is their space and, and how they are getting in there, um, it that that's where you lose them. So in order to equip somebody, a messenger or, or a recruiter, you have to first make sure those people are willing to listen, right? Like if you can't listen to any type of conversation that is different from what you're hearing in your own echo chamber, you are not the best messenger or recruiter period, right? Like you, you have to be able to hear something and not immediately respond. And, and mm -hmm. a lot of 18 and 24 year olds, they want to be seen and, and heard. So we have to view them as the full grown individuals that they are, mm -hmm. even if it is something that is completely different um, and antithetical to how we show up in the space, how we show up is not the only way to show up in any space. Yeah, I would go, um, I'm, email knows I'm very practical. <laughs> uh, I am very much like, let's just get to the nitty gritty. And from what I'm understanding, you know, how do I equip credible messengers and recruiters? Um, I would do the work of trying to find a peer to peer messenger and a peer to peer recruiter, right? Um, a lot of times um, you can have the best of intentions and still how you may re respond or how someone may respond or recruit or engage may just be a little bit off, right? Um, and so if we're able to identify peer to peer messengers or recruiters, that would be great. If you don't have that as an option um, and, and because it all of this is relationship based. So that is the other component that I wanna say is like, you're, it may be like, well, how do I find somebody that's 18 to 24? Well, first of all, we have to build a relationship with somebody. What, what's Who's in your network that's 18 to 24? That perhaps if you mentor them a little bit and provide some talking points for them, they then can become this messenger on your behalf uh, to recruit, right? So it's, the, it's sort of a train the trainer type opportunity. Um, and then in terms of what tools that can be used, this is when doing the research on like organizations who are already geared towards engaging that demographic, right? Um, and what are they doing? There's organizations like RISE who um, are specifically engaging college students all over the country and they are training them to talk about these things. So perhaps creating a, 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 an opportunity to engage with um, RISE, one of the local chapters or, you know, 
the, you know, all of the young electeds that we have here at this organization who've gone through this process, who might have been 18 or 24, you know, um, uh, you know, who we know were 18 or 24 at some point, you know, they may have immediate contacts, you know, right now. So it really is building the relationships, trying to identify peer to peer um, validators, um, you know, if you work with local radio stations who have the opportunity to get the word out, um, see if you can create a partnership with them um, so that maybe your message is coming across, you know, at the same time, teach me how the Dougie is playing, right? Like you just have to figure out how to, um, you know, how to how to align that. Um, but I, I typically find the, the closer I can get to finding a validator or a um, a um, recruiter or messenger that is um, proximate to the same age um, and empower them to be the voice. Um, that typically is 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 the strategy that that we use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. That's a, I, I I agree with all of that. In terms of equipping, check out our toolkit. Mm -hmm. uh, toolkits we find tools. You can equip yourself with the tools. Uh, Peoplefor.org has an excellent set of toolkits. This one, particularly for faith leaders, um, works well. But yeah, find, listen, find credible messengers. Here's what I've learned um, as a millennial. I don't think I'm an elder millennial. I'm like peak millennial. I'm so, I have an absolute no idea because somehow I'm, I'm still a peak millennial, millennial too. So you're, here's, you're what peak. I, here's what I learned. You're, anyway. you're peak, you're peak. I'm peak, thank you. That's all I was, I was fishing for that. Um, don't don't reach because you'll pull a muscle. <laughs> don't don't reach too far. Don't be uh, Steve Buscemi walking through the hallways <laughs> with a skateboard saying, "Hey, fellow kids, how are we doing?" So just you know, be yourself and find credible messages in that age range, and give them the tools. You know, trust the the youth will lead us. Just trust that they can lead us. Indeed. Give them the tools. Let them lead the way. Lovely. Which is, I think, we wanted to close on that song. Yes, Michael. Which song is that? I, I believe that. Oh. That children are future. Yeah, indeed. Um, friends, thank you so much uh, for this. <laughs> I'm not going to start singing, but thank you for this. Um, to, the to one let brother. it out because you're singing it in your head. <laughs> oh, I know. I can see you. I'm actually not. Right. I'm actually not. I saw a meme that the said that the hurting. children uh, that are tired because that was the song that came out. <laughs> 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 like there's too much pressure. It has been pressure since that song came out. Oh, but no, uh, I thank you so much, uh, Michael Ray Matthews, for this incredible moment. Shout out to Salah me. and to Robert for sharing your thoughts um, and oh, your yes. questions. I thank saw you. um, that and Rob Kentoma, yeah. Ithaca, great yes. mayor, good man. Great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for, for noting that. And thank and thank to you know you three for, for jumping in. Please check out the toolkit um, online at People for Faith Votes. Um, there's in the toolkit analysis and reflections and ideas for preaching and teaching. It can probably be applied in many different contexts. It's probably just good insights that might be, make for good conversation mm -hmm. and reflection in your communities. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks to have another conversation. It's going to be a reunion of my former co-host of the four podcast, Dr. Otis Moss III, Dr. Jackie Lewis, and Lisa Sharon Harper. It's mm -hmm. going to be a good time. We're going to build on the great wisdom that we've already been able to nurture in this space. Thank you, Dewana. Thank you, Emil. Thank you, Savante. Peace and blessings to everyone.